stones. <laughs> Too much calcium or oxalate in your diet. Oh, yeah? One of the nurses thinks it's caused by stress. Fuck, then I'd probably go. Ooh! Two Days in the Valley is a 1996 American crime film directed by John Herzfeld with an ensemble cast starring Danny Aiello, Eric Stoltz, James Spader, Jeff Daniels, Terry Hatcher, and introducing Charlize Theron. Let's take a quick look. You have one minute to decide the rest of your life. On the day it happened, two vice cops were doing their duty. This is a nice place to live. I would like to keep it that way. A woman was living on the edge. You've never done that before. An art dealer was falling apart. Oh. Oh. And a director was ready to call it quits. Ow, ow. But a murder. Why'd you let him sit up? was one way to bring them all together. Get comfortable. Help! Help! He, he's dead. I, I need to call the police. Lady, we are the police. MGM Pictures presents... This is where you get out. Roy Stammer, he killed him. A story of intrigue. What's going on? This guy's holding us hostage. Greed. What are you gonna do? I'm going to get our money. <sighs> Surgery. You don't have to be that homely. I'd pay for implants and liposuction, but don't take it as an insult. <laughs> Coincidence. My partner and I discovered this crime scene this morning. Uh, I think that Becky Fox might be in on this. Really? <laughs> Captivity. You got any uh, pasta here? Any marinara sauce? You want us to cook for you? No, no. I'll cook. Rivalry. I mean, I know we're Valley Detectives, so we're not all that bright, but how stupid does he think we are? Bravery. Go ahead. Shoot me. What are you, crazy? I, I think he's suicidal. We all have our flaws. Dogs. He's not vicious. He just wants to fetch. He's waiting for you to throw the gun. And ammunition. I'm a police officer. Stay where you are. <laughs> There. Maybe that's how they make love in Tarzana. <laughs> no! No! Ten people in LA. One moment in time. Time's up. Two days. In the valley. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. I'm your host, John. You know that by now. And I would like to introduce my very special guest for the very first time on this show, another John. Uh, a John that, you know, the face might be familiar, but this is, forget what you know, this is Johnny Mulligans. Sir, mm -hmm. thanks for joining me on the Cult of Films. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I, I can't help but... Uh, just, I mean, you remind me of someone. I can't put my finger on it, uh, but yeah. Don't, it's, it's... don't worry about it. Don't oh, worry about okay. it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm glad that you're here and, uh, you know, you, you like films because that's what we're talking about today. I hope you like drinking because joining me on this episode, I am uh, drinking an Elysian from Seattle, Washington, a split shot. Sir. That's do, a good uh, one. Yeah, do you have a uh, special? Oh, I do. Here? I do. I have today, I have some bird dog. Uh, this is a Kentucky bourbon whiskey. It's b better than Jim Beam White Label, but not one of the expensive ones. It's like a $30 bottle. It's fine. It's good. You throw some ice in it, it works. Perfect. Uh, Lahayam? Bird dog that we have in Seattle, we only have the apple version, so we don't have just the regular bourbon version. There's an apple version. <laughs> yeah, they've got they got a couple different dogs. This one's the Irish Setter version. It doesn't mm. taste like an Irish Setter. I don't know what they taste like <laughs> in the first place, but the, this, the, you know, my family had an Irish Setter years ago, and I was like, oh, I had a dog like that. Let's see yeah. what the whiskey tastes like. Oh, it's whiskey. All right. <laughs> Let's see if it tastes like dog. Uh, <laughs> it just tastes like bird, you know. <laughs> we are gathered here today to talk about one of my favorite films from the 90s, Johnny, and that is Two Days in the Valley, directed by John Herzfeld. Who is John Herzfeld? Well, 
I guess his claim to fame is this film. Uh, Cobra would be another one, his next biggest film. So he wasn't like, this was just the, the mid nineties, perfect storm for John Herzfeld. Like he got uh, the who's who of the nineties, you know, James, mm -hmm. Smith, but, but it was kind of like a passing of the baton as well. This was like the last big movie for a lot of these, like, you know, late eighties, early nineties actors. And then, mm -hmm. but I mean, a, a meteoric start for one, you know, Academy Award winner, Charlize Theron. Mm -hmm. She was 19 years old when they filmed this, Johnny. That was, that fact was, uh, I didn't realize this was her very first and I like lose track of time and don't realize like, oh yeah, Charlize Theron, that's cool to see some of her early work. Oh, it's her first big motion picture. Yeah. Okay. Kind of makes you feel a little awkward uh, yeah, a little, with, some, it with does. some of the scenes in this. It does make it a little awkward knowing what, like, having those details and be like, all right, <laughs> okay. That was, uh, I mean, you know, she dove in and that paid dividends down the road. Like, that that definitely put her put a spotlight on her work and, and she definitely went on to do a ton of work with yeah. other movies and other directors. And, and, yeah, you can see, I love, it was fun watching this because, you know, like the first half hour is a little weird with the storylines. It, it just, they, they're all over the place. And even my wife was watching it with me. She's like, ah, this is kind of oh, wonky. Yeah. But you, it was like seeing all these faces. And the thing that reminded me of is like Chef with um, um, John Favreau, like calling in all the favors with the Marvel people, playing these, these novelty roles. It, it was just like all of these faces I grew up with in the 80s and 90s so i remember a lot of these faces and and like yeah i've seen those in other movies and jeff daniels in other movies and it's just like you know i we're right now we're watching uh my wife and i are marathoning through the blacklist on netflix so mm. we're tuned into james spader right now and just kind of like it was fun to see spader's early work as that like ivy lee globe trotting psychopathic murderer <laughs> and it like he's really he really nails it and he's yeah. fine-tuned it over the years. I love how he's kind of like, he's got that part. But he's got some other work out there. I'm glad it's not the only thing he does. Right, yeah. This this is a James Spader role if there was a James Spader role, right? This is, mm -hmm. he is just the complete standout. I, I think Charlie Theron did a great job. And everyone gets their time to shine on this. And you're mm -hmm. right, the, the continuity uh, and the cadence of this movie is a little wonky. It's one of those, you know, a lot of people... I think unjustly compare this to a Pulp Fiction just because there's so many uh, intersecting storylines. You you are bombarded with characters. It all seems like there's like five five or six plots going at once, and then they all kind of intertwine it and, and meet up at the end. Uh, but it's not shot at a sequence like a Pulp Fiction. This is more. Right. Uh, this is just what's going on over literally two days in the in the uh, Los Angeles Valley. Yeah, like like Paul, the Quentin Tarantino films are always about trying to mess with your head, like time sequence, sort of like, what was it, um, um, the one with uh, Brad Pitt, World War Two style, Glorious Bastards. They like they start with the ending and then you go through the movie and you're looking for the ending again. It's like that's not the right ending. <laughs> but this one was just this one is almost like there were a bunch of off ramps, and there was like dead ends. <laughs> Sure. Or, like Jeff Daniels' character, you get through the movie and you have to ask yourself, like, what was, what yeah. was that all about, other than making you feel sad? <laughs> <laughs> it's like this poor cop lost his kid. He's dad number one. And now the kid's got dad number two, and it's just, just this sad, spy, downward spiral of a person's life. And then moving on, and they're off. <laughs> we're off to the next plot. It was, right. It was seemed weird. It's like Jeff. This almost felt like. Jeff Daniels was doing someone a favor, or they were doing him a favor, or it's like, hey, we got a role. You want to do a thing? Sure, why not? I need a paycheck. And, and that's what that was one of the the I, I would say issues with the movies that that they had so many balls in the air, it was almost impossible yeah. not to drop a couple. But for the most part, I think they handled it very well. And I think uh, this was, uh, I mean, Jeff, you said doing this for a paycheck. I think this was right after Dumb and Dumber, so he was coming off making. He, he just exploded and he just kind of you probably did them a favor by uh gracing the the presence for yeah mr uh, john herzfeld 
<laughs> Actually, this is like this is basically managers doing managers' favors. Like, yo, I, you know, I scratch your back for Dumb and Dumber. You want to help me out here? <laughs> yeah, pro- probably. Uh, <laughs> and, and even the crew w- was absolutely uh, fantastic on this. I mean, the cinematographer was Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood would do uh, a lot of other comedies. I know he did uh, like the other guys and Step Brothers. He mm-hmm. shot uh, the the Tim Story Fantastic Four. Uh, but he was also <laughs> responsible for a lot of the Bourne movies. So Shaky Cam, yeah. you could blame Oliver Wood. But you know, this is a this is a cameraman with chops. You also had Catherine. Hardwick as the uh, production manager. She is the director of movies like 13 or the first Twilight movie as well. Uh, so, you know, th- this was just like packed to the gills with big names and talent. And I think y- for, and this is just a hypothesis, but uh, I have a feeling that when uh, direct, like when Hollywood is trying to make a movie about Hollywood, I like to call them Hollywood wank films. And I feel like this <laughs> is a little bit, it's set in Hollywood. This is kind of like, you know, it's not so much like La La Land where it's like this uh, romance of, you know, any, anyone could be a dreamer and succeed in this town. This is like, no, you're living in like, on like Loma Linda. This is all the, the, the waiters and waitresses that didn't make it to the big time. This is about the, the director screenwriter that, that put out such a pile of shit that he had to try to kill himself, you know? So, the failed director. The, yeah, yeah. The, the... It's like a it's like an anti Hollywood wink film, but it's still like, uh, oh, you know, like I don't know. I feel like studios are just they they go out and they they give the filmmaker a little bit more uh, if you're if you're setting your your uh, your movie in this kind of setting. Oh yeah, because you know all all your set locations are easy access. You can mm-hmm. you need one of the major you need a major landmark from Hollywood. Oh, it's here. Yeah, yeah. go down the street. You're fine. It won't it, cost a, what is it, a gas tank of gas. Fine, whatever. Write it off. They just love to smell their own farts. But John, <laughs> uh, what is Two Days in the Valley about? Uh, Two Days in the Valley is is this kind of sequence of stories around a murder scandal. Uh, basically, a a failed yeah. There's a lot of failed. A, Failed Olympic skier or skater uh, is has is working with uh, Lee. That's uh, that's James Spader's character and Charlize Theron's character Helga to get their get her husband murdered, but they didn't tell her when. So they drug her in her bed while he's laying next to her, and then Spader introduces his little sixty seconds for the rest of your life shtick oh, that so becomes it's, it's like this ticking. It's like almost like they had a they got support from sixty minutes and they wanted to get that guerrilla marketing in there. <laughs> and, and it's just it's like they open up with this weird murder scene. He plays this crazy person and it's like, ah oh, it's ah, oh, it's nice. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 this this murder ties in all of these different people like these vice cops who are one was is aspiring the other one is this uh, weird hating whores and asians for some reason kind of cop yeah this kind of cycle which we find out yeah at the end we find out you are deemed unfit because of your psychological eval you have 48 (laughs) hours turned your badge and gun you know then you've got this overbearing high rank that's like this this overpaid privileged dude with all of these like all of these assumptions about women that clearly would not make it into a 2020 film. And you're like, that didn't age well. And they <laughs> and made them you... British, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they made them British. I, like it's... I don't know how that fixes it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like the, the hell... And then you've got the hitman that was the patsy that was trying to be killed. It's like, there's just, you've got this, this, this stew. And you're just trying to get it all to marinate it together. And it comes together in this, this like, everyone gets stuck in this one rich dude's house. And they're all trying to get down the hill. And you can't get down the hill with driving past the murder scene. And that just <laughs> happens to be where the murderer is. Yeah. Who by up until up until who was it? Uh look at for who's who here. Eric Stoltz. Up until he's about to kill Eric Stoltz and then opts not to. Cause, yeah, yeah. Because well, Helga showed up, shot, and I'm like <laughs> I was like right there, I was like, Well, that's what that that's important. He yeah. just basically blew three people away just without thinking about it and uh just figured oh i'm gonna take a break now well, that's that's where it all unravels for him that's if he only knew if he just like just pulled the trigger <laughs> he just did that he would have seen he would have seen the guy who wanted to kill himself show up with his 22 sure yeah <laughs> like how do you how do you not see that he's like oh, I, I met the plot scene i'm gonna win no no you're gonna get shot with a with a bb gun the plot holes weren't like Grand Canyon esque, but they sure. were there. 
yeah the little sure. things the little things that would be things i assume would be typical of 90s films which i you know you go back and watch things from the 90s you're like oh that was funnier when i first saw it now i get it sort of like <laughs> sort of like the uh dennis leary's no cure for cancer i i was a teenager when i heard that the first time oh, so sure. funny i thought it was hilarious then it showed up on netflix it's like oh nostalgia i went back and watched it and it's like this isn't funny as I thought it was. But... <laughs> Jokes from the 90s don't uh, really translate to the year 2020. No, the no year that they didn't forgot. age. They didn't age well. Yeah, and yeah, and like you said, it's it's perfect. It's just this intersecting, you know, hit ma- these bumbling hitman with you know intersecting with bumbling cops. Everyone's like uh, an almost or a or a has been or a have mm-hmm. not. Uh, I love uh, the leading man in this, Danny uh, Aiello, Dosmo Pizzo. If you say it loud enough, it almost sounds like Domino's Pizza. Uh, he's he's this uh, you know kind of uh, try hard. Uh, bad at his job hitman and he thinks he's uh, scoring another chance uh where he gets kind of um called up to the big leagues by lee played played by james spader and yeah it just doesn't you know and, and then it just like goes downhill from them but i think that this movie is pretty funny and watching it even now i i was still chuckling quite quite a bit um where it's not it's not as like brutal or even brutal at all really as like uh like a tarantino film like what it's i guess uh, unjustly uh compared to but i think that it was it's not slow paced and it and everyone's in the dialogue and the script is, is witty enough to keep your attention going and, and it's a mm-hmm. quick like you know hour and a half yeah, and like once once you get in, like once you get through that kind of that muddle of what the hell's going on here, half hour in the beginning as they're pulling all these storylines together, it does it, it pulls it together, and, and you definitely have an interest in what's going on and why is is Lee going to get away and who's going to die and and where did where did Becky go? It's like you know, there all these pieces just they they did work, and I liked I liked the way it wrapped up. It was funny because in the beginning, like Ayala's character, it's almost you know, it almost feels like, okay, he's a patsy in this whole plan and he happened to survive. And it didn't, to me, he, he didn't feel like main character immediately. It's like mm-hmm. they, they kind of almost like they buried the lead on that one a little bit. And then once you start seeing the interaction, everyone's getting pulled into that location he's at, then you're like, okay, this is now this is starting to make more sense. And it's almost like he, he gets, gets shot down and they build that character up over the course of the movie. And and there's some conclusion there. Like they wrap it up. He gets to go off into the sunset with a thirty grand and his new girlfriend. Right. And, and you know that was that was a nice piece of conclusion to a story. Yeah, because he's not. Yeah. I, I mean, even in, in his life, this was the first time in Dosmo's life that he was the main character, right? Like, because mm-hmm. it just seems like he was always like if this this felt felt like a movie. If you made a movie about one of like. Uh, you're, you're watching like a Batman movie or something and what and the Joker or the Penguin, they have stooges, right? This feels like if you made an entire movie centered around, you know, the life or two days in the life of one of the stooges. <laughs> and it's just like and then he gets his time to shine against the Joker himself. And I think that because uh, James Bader was just so menacing in this. Dare I say, sexy in this? He had hair. You can you can say it. Young. I he mean, had hair. He, he was he was he was like. Fantastic. All right, James, what you got? <laughs> and like those scenes, like with with him and uh, Charlie Theron, albeit a little creepy now that we have context how old she was. But <laughs> God, that that scene is hot. Like it, it's super hot. It's it shot really well. Uh, what mm-hmm. a daring performance from Charlize Theron! Like, not only did she was she a hundred percent like fearless with what she was asked to do on screen for this movie, but mm-hmm. she kept up with with these people that have been in the industry at this point forever. Yeah, and and that's kind of like you know I think about we you think about that kind of a role where where female character female actresses are asked to do these kinds of roles, and I think about like Halle Berry, and there was a an interview with um one of the movies she did years ago where she she had a topless scene Monster Ball and yeah I think and there was yeah I think it was Monster Ball and Leap of Faith basically like she took a chance and she took the role and she went it it just you know like. 
I don't know how I feel about like, is this the way, is this something where something sounds like casting couch and crazy weird stuff? And I was like, I don't know how I, I don't like that being like this requisite thing, but she took this chance and it paid off. It paid dividends down the road for her because for sure she put on not just the scenes, but she put on a good for performance. So that's, that's what matters. Like she did a good job. Like you said, Matt, you know, holding her own with all of these other bigger names. So I'm, I'm assuming Spader, Spader had been around for a while too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like he'd been working. I think I look, we, you know, the original film he had actually recommended me was an old film with him and Robbie, Dar Jun Robert Downey Jr. From what was it? The late eighties they had. Yeah. Least. Less so, than zero. So they had, you know, they, you know, these, these actors have been around for a while. So, you know, Charlie's there and, Stepping up to the plate, did some awesome work. I think and... this was like the fourth movie that uh, Stoltz and Spader were together on, too, which is kind of weird. The, the, you, know, you never think of like James Spader and Eric Stoltz as being this package deal, but they were in a ton of movies together. So, you know, everyone had this camaraderie. Uh, Teddy Pepper's the, the failed uh, director, but real life uh, writer director uh, also. And it was, it was kind of cool to see him. Uh, take take on this role and kind of own it. Like Alex in Wonderland, his big claim to fame was Down and Out in Beverly Hills, um, you know, with Richard Dreyfuss, Bette Midler. So, uh, you know, everyone just did such good work uh, in this film. And again, you know, the fact that, she, that Charlize Theron at 19 years old was able to come off as dangerous, funny, and sexy. I mean, she's screaming. She has to, like pull off a crazy death scene in Swedish like <laughs> in Swedish <laughs> just a ton of shit to do um and, and Terry Hatcher th th this again I, I kind of mentioned like passing the baton like this is right after Terry Hatcher came off of uh the Dean Kane Superman show as Lois Lane and then she did this film and then she went into uh Desperate Housewives uh, Desperate Housewives but um you know, she was, this was kind of a, a passing baton where she was like that, that young kind of, uh, sex pot back in the, in the eighties and the, in the real early nineties too. And then she, you know, kind of took a more mature role, uh, going forward. So it was just a real cool, uh, you know, not only just like the performances on the screen, but just like what happened with these actors career going forward because it was just so star studded a lot of them like jeff daniels and charlie's theron you know continued to rise unfortunately mm -hmm. for a lot of them or for a few of them this was kind of a snake bitten cast uh as far as uh we we lost a, a couple of them like i mentioned um paul mm -hmm. Murzowski, he died uh, he died uh glenn glenn headley uh who played susan Parrish. yeah uh, i i was going through the imdb i was like oh my God, yeah. she wasn't she wasn't that old. She passed away in 2017. She, she was so good was in like, this film. Yeah. Yeah, she did a great job in this movie. I I loved her character. I loved like I loved that interaction like that whole this this little like budding flirtation between Ayala's character and Headley. And it was it was kind of like this cute little side note sweet. and it turned yeah, yeah, it was sweet and it started off like this sweet little thing. It's like, "Oh, that's cute. Where is that going to go?" And it becomes like the centerpiece at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. Like these, you know, it it was that was a nice piece of the film. I I enjoyed that. And just some of these I I don't want not not any digs against, you know, Jeff Daniels or what we got uh Eric Stoltz like those characters almost didn't need to be in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a dig against them. They do great work, but man, it's just kind of like the opening scene was a weird start to the movie. It's like, well, which opening scene? There's a couple opening scenes. Like the one, <laughs> the one where Stoltz's yeah, character is in the massage parlor. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, yeah. uh, this is, uh, it's not how that works. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I guess that works in some place. Uh, Tell me how nope. it works, Johnny. <laughs> no, it doesn't, doesn't doesn't work like that. That's yeah. It's not official. No, yeah. That's not how that works. So. And, and the the biggest heartbreaking one was Danny Aiello too. He you know his passing. He was he lived well into his eighties. He did some mm -hmm. great work. You know? Yeah. Um, and he was like he did a lot of mobster stuff. Like yeah. he's, he he worked he played that that Italian mobster role in so many pieces. Like I think he was was he Sopranos was he in there? He was in Godfather too. I don't think he was, he was in Sopranos. He was kind of more OG than you know the Soprano yeah. cast. Because uh, I feel like it's. I feel like he's done works with like pe people like Pacino and Robert um, Robert De Niro, and he just it feels like I feel like I've seen him in those kinds of pieces. He was Tony and Leon the Professional, which was great, and then also uh, like one of his biggest roles was Moonstruck uh, with Cher uh, and Nicolas Cage. But he, I mean, he was just such uh, you, you know, like you said, he has a type, um, you know, that that mm -hmm. soprano type, but. 
I, I think he just sold this like pathetic loser hitman with a heart like like and that's why you know it kind of showed like oh in this business you know you have to be to be the best you have to be this this calculated cold-blooded killer uh you know no matter what you know james spader never faltered on on his like regiment and that's why he's just like uh you know calling cosmo you know dumbo and stuff and he's just like you know i that's what that's why you'll you'll be where you are and i'll be why where i am and you know even when he has to put down his his own girlfriend uh james spader he mm -hmm. has that same kind of like calculation about it um just because you know he's a true professional but you know then it shows that someone like dosmos that his he, he has his own kind of code of ethics and stuff like that and he actually has ethics and that's why you know the the, the turn and, and why you're able to to root for him so much more than than uh, james spader in this so yeah i do i did appreciate like in in the scene in oh god i think it's kurt wells uh, alan hopper's house the rich dude like yeah. the stuck up rich dude so like there's that interaction between um dosmo and alan and then you've got oh god what was his paul miscas a teddy teddy pepper's character um did i get that right yeah, yeah. The, the failed producer like who was i'm trying to remember who was the on like the i the the word of a, the word of a loser, more more often than not, is more reliable than the word of a winner. Yeah, yeah. Like I, love that I, word. I thought I enjoyed that. That was pretty fun to see that kind of even those two characters who are like, I'm gonna kill you if you do a thing, <laughs> but even the victims be like, even though you're a loser, you're still a winner. It's like that yeah. was that was pretty cool. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it had great lines, like like impactful lines like that, and then just like funny comedy lines were just like. No, you, you eat you eat your fucking spaghetti on the floor. What your fucking dog? <laughs> Not another fucking dog. <laughs> it's like just like this point of the gun at the you know, like in the first part of the movie, he shows up, he's sitting at the pool, he's like holding this pistol. He's just like holding this gun. It's this dog. It's this dog. The dogs hate me. It's like the dog just wants to play fetch. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even growling. This is like one of the happiest dogs you will ever see. He's just oh, waiting for yet. you to toss the gun so he can go fetch it and accidentally shoot you. Right. But, you know, <laughs> it was it was hilarious. He's got this irrational fear of dogs that are not actually angry at him. Yeah. Just good decisions. Like, good decisions all around. Uh, like, way more funny than uh, a lot of its uh, contemporary films were you know back then so i i was i was very pleased with this it is a ton of fun it's uh you know like i said don't go into it expecting uh pulp fiction or even reservoir dogs it's not that this is more it's it's a little bit more lighthearted. although there are some there's definitely some dark scenes i mean you, mm -hmm. you are seeing yeah. some point blank you know sniper shots uh that i that are more efficient than anything i could pull off in, in goldeneye uh, <laughs> back on the N64. I mean, there yeah. is, it doesn't shy away from a, a, a lot of the stuff, but it's not as just like overtly brutal. Um, no, there's, I mean, there's plenty of F bombs. It's, it's, it's not your, it's not your father's mob movie. You know, it, it still has some, some edge to it where, you know, you, you could enjoy it. Um, but yeah, it, there's the, the, there's, there is some problems, not a perfect film. So like you said, some of the, the turnpikes, get off too early like mm -hmm. jeff daniels yeah. just kind of disappears from the movie but you know you got to see uh you know instead of two days in the valley with jeff daniels you got to see about six hours in the valley yeah yeah basically i did i did enjoy the part like and some of these characters don't even technically cross paths but sure. i did enjoy the scene like Dan, uh, you've got Jeff Daniels' character sitting in the car with the Super Soaker, and he's like, he's playing with Super Soaker. He's sitting at, they're sitting at the red light, and Spader's character's in the car next to him. Yeah. And by the time he pulls the Super Soaker down, Spader's just looking at him like, "You're a crazy motherfucker. <laughs> What's wrong with you?" Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I was like, "Are they gonna meet again?" Oh no, they didn't. No. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> they, just that had go. nothing to do with it. <laughs> right. Great movie. I would recommend it for anyone that likes. Um, you know 90s comedy films if you like mob film, this, mm -hmm. although it's kind of hard to call it a mob film it's it's, more it's of a not film. it's it's more like it's more like 90s cosmo murder yeah. mystery-esque type thing and then like uh, speaking of plot lines and weird turnoffs it's like the very end of the movie you've got terry hatcher's character walks up the hill to her car yeah with a parking ticket i'm like is that 
is that an important plot point? Like, is this suggesting that she planned the whole thing? Like, she got away with it and played all the sides in one? Is but, that what we're seeing here? here? I'm like, here's the thing. I like that about her character because you know every everyone that survived, you know people people live by the gun and died by the gun, and like like James Spader was was unrelenting and he died by you know, the code mm -hmm. essentially. Um, Dosmo realized that he wasn't cut out for that. So he, you know, he came, he had this growth. I like Terry Hatcher's arc because she didn't learn a goddamn thing. She's still stuck. <laughs> you know, she thinks she is, she literally is this fourth place type of human being uh, where she's just like, okay, I, you know, I put in all the work. So I just, assume that I deserve everything good coming to me. And then she kind of, it, it seemingly, she comes out of this thing, uh, you know, with, with like the insurance money from, from the hit from her, from her yep. husband and all that. But then you see her just like get in the car and then on the, the, the bumper sticker, it's like, uh, you know, on my way to, to the Olympics 98 or whatever. So she, <laughs> it's like, she learned nothing. She didn't grow as a character. She's just a piece of shit. She's, she's basically <laughs> the biggest piece of shit in the entire cast. So I, I like that they had someone like that. There's like sort of like the the staple, almost like it's always it's always good for me. I love seeing when when a main character is killed within the first half hour of the movie. Sure, sort of, yeah. It like tells me it's like ah, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Kill all the main characters, and that gets a star. That's it's how I, I, it's unreasonable. It's an unrealistic expectation, but you know it works for some movies. Yeah. It, it felt like very bad things, but with like a, a like a hopeful ending kind of like if you're a fan of like those ty type of films. Um, yeah, but it, it's great. Uh, it's kind of harder to find. I know the there it really needs a Blu-ray uh, release because the the DVD, uh, it doesn't look very clean. Um, so, I mean, I can't believe that this this film with this much. Uh, with this much pizzazz, you know, behind it, for lack of a better word, doesn't have a Blu-ray yet. But uh, I, I wish it would. And and considering, like, even with the pizzazz, it's like, this is an older movie. We're getting to the point where this is really classified as an older movie. Sure. With what we got uh, 30 plus years on this thing now. So mm -hmm. I was surprised, like, when, well, it's funny. Around the time the lockdowns for the pandemic started, there was a whole lot of weird new old stuff that showed up on Netflix, and I was surprised this didn't show up as one of those. <clears throat> Just because, you know, like Netflix had got some new contracts, and it looked like they got a bunch of these kind of old pieces that haven't seen the light of day for a while, and they were like, well, here's some daytime movie to watch. And and we didn't see, I didn't see this there. I went over to Amazon Prime. You can rent it there. and But they, even they didn't have it on demand. It was right. interesting to, to see, like, you know, this, there, there's, there comes a point where you think there'd be more offerings of some of these older movies, but they're not there. So I don't know. Maybe it's because they don't see. It's like in that weird spot where it's not going to be high enough demand to put it on like regular streaming. But if somebody wants to pay to see it, good on them. Otherwise, they're just kind of, kind of sit on it. This, there's, it's weird. Yeah. And I don't have the budget uh, on it because it's not listed, but it only made 11 million bucks. So I'm sure that it costs more than that to make, you would assume. I mean, there you know, not a ton of effects aside from some good uh, practical effects with, you know, just squibs Pyro and, and yeah. blood and stuff like that. But Pyrotechnics and explosions. Yeah, and maybe, maybe you're not getting too much uh, of the budget, but only making 11 million, even in 96, it probably <laughs> lost money. So it wasn't like, it was like kind of middle of the road received. I think uh, Ebert gave it three and a half stars. So he, you know, there, there were some critics that liked it and some critics thought it was just a Pulp Fiction knockoff. So, you know, there, like you said, there wasn't a huge clamoring for, um, yeah this to, and, to come out better like 1996 i'm in the middle of high school at that point like you 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 ran this by me i don't recall this movie in any form at all like dumb and Tragic. dumber would have yeah yeah dumb and dumber would have been like oh i know dumb and dumber but uh this wouldn't strike me as something jeff daniels showed up in like that that's the thing like there's a whole bunch i saw this movie i saw all these faces and i was like i know all these people but I don't know this movie. It was kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a black hole in everyone's radar, but I, I freaking <laughs> love this movie. Uh, 
Go out and, and check it out on Prime, and let's all mm-hmm. start a petition to get this thing with a Blu-ray release. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's our that's our review of Two Days in the Valley, uh, directed by John Herzfeld. I'm John Dunning. You could find me uh, now on the official Twitter account, and that's just simply the cult at the cult of films. Or if you want to talk to me uh, on my personal one, it's at Orzov Dunn. Mr. Johnny Mulligans, the rebrand, the myth, the man, the legend. Mm-hmm. Thank the you for duo. joining me on this. Where can everyone find you, sir? Uh, right now, you can find me on Twitter, and it's at Johnny Mulligans. And uh, that's it. There it is. Full reboot. I'm I'm just starting over. <laughs> Very good. Well, in uh, I see, I don't have a, uh, I never have a sign off for this. So uh, let's mm-hmm. let's just take sixty seconds to think think of one. It takes 60 seconds to think of one. All right. Um, 